Thank you, Dave. So, well log correlation is an important step in many geologic and geophysical interpretation methods, such as building geologic models and time depth conversion. In the past, well log correlation was commonly done by hand, but due to the rapidly increasing number of well logs, we require automatic methods. And the, the existing automatic methods can be separated into two main parts, the correlation of a single pair of well logs and the correlation of many well logs. Our method uses pairwise correlations in order to simultaneously correlate many logs. But before I describe our method, I'd first like to explain what I mean by correlation and introduce a few terms that I'll be using throughout my talk. And to do that, I will use six wells from Teapot Dome with locations shown here. And this is a constant, a constant time slice at about one second through Teapot Dome. One thing to note here is that well three passes through the top of anticline. So when we look at the velocity logs provided with this data, we can see that veloc distinct velocity layers in log three appear at shallower depths than in any of the logs on the flanks. Now, well log correlation is the process of determining corresponding depths among well logs. And a single set of such corresponding depths imply that the sediments at those depths were deposited with the same, or deposited at the same time. And so we can therefore map these logs from depth to time to get an image such as this. And here, the values of relative geologic time are arbitrary. All that we're saying is that sediments with earlier relative geologic times are younger than those with later relative geologic times. Now, for any constant relative geologic time, we have a set of six corresponding depths, one for each log. And if you focus on the velocity layers within the black rectangle, we can find sets of corresponding depths for each constant relative, relative geologic time within this, and then map from time back to depth to get our final correlation, which gives us an idea of the structure in the subsurface. And here again, you can see that well three is, passes through the top of the anticline. Now, if you recall, I had mentioned that our, um, our method uses pairwise correlations in order to simultaneously correlate many logs. So, to, um, so I'd first like to describe how we automatically correlate many, or automatically correlate a single pair of well logs. And to do that, I'll use logs one and two from earlier. And first, I'd like to note that it is common to process logs before correlation in order to remove large measurement errors that are common in logs. But we have done no such pre-processing to any of the logs that I will show today. So therefore, large measurement errors still exist, and I've just pointed out three here. Now, I'd like to zoom in to this about 200 meter subsection of these two logs so that we can view them in more detail. There are many existing methods that we can use in order to automatically correlate these two well logs. We chose to use dynamic warping because it is robust in the presence of geologic gaps due to um, erosion or faulting. And before I describe how we use dynamic warping to correlate these logs, I'd like to quickly change notation a bit. So I will now refer to the values of these logs as fi of little i and fj of little j, where capital I and j are the indices of the logs, and little i and little j are the indices of depths within the logs. So as Dave mentioned, the first step of dynamic warping is to compute alignment errors between each sample in log i and each sample in log j using the equation shown here. And we produce a plot such as this, which is similar to what Dave showed earlier, except that here we are computing alignment errors on an ij coordinate system rather than an il coordinate system. Also. When using dynamic warping to correlate well logs, 
it is common to use the L2 norm in the alignment error calculation. And the L2 norm squares the, the, the differences between the log values. So when large measurement errors are present, alignment errors become huge. <coughs> For this reason, we chose to use a smaller value of a norm. And in our case, we found through experimentation that the L1 quarter norm works best for our specific data set. Now, if we look at a point on this plot, denoted by the orange dot, this point tells us that a depth of about one kilometer in log one corresponds to a depth of 960 meters in log two. And using dynamic warping, we can find a sequence of all such corresponding depths. And as Dave mentioned, dynamic warping uses dynamic programming in order to find an optimal path, which is essentially a sequence of IJ pairs that minimizes the sum of alignment errors along that path. And in our case, that gives us a sequence of corresponding depths. Now, there are many possible warping paths, but for simplicity, I'll use this schematic which just has two possible paths, path A and path B. And what you'll notice is that path B is much shorter than path A. So it is possible that when we sum alignment errors along path B, the sum will be much smaller than the alignment errors along path A. And therefore, path B could be optimal simply due to it being shorter than path A. To avoid this, many methods require all warping paths to pass through the lower left and the upper right corner of the IJ coordinate system. But this requires um, some other methods, such as manual picking, in order to determine corresponding depths at the top and the bottom of the logs. So instead, we chose to use a rotated KL coordinate system, where K is equal to J plus I, and L is equal to J minus I, where L here is a measurement of lag or essentially the difference between two depths. And so we get a new rotated coordinate system on which to compute alignment errors. Now, you'll notice that the corners of this KL grid lie outside of the IJ grid. And what this means is that these are points where either FI or FJ is null. And so when we compute alignment errors at these points, we use a randomly chosen non-null value from the log that is missing the data in place of the null value. By doing this, we are ensuring that the non-null value is within the range of our data, and so alignment errors computed at these points are comparable to alignment errors computed at points where neither FI nor FJ are null except at points where we have an optimal path. So now we can again find the path that minimizes the sum of alignment errors along the paths. And what you'll notice here is that path A and path B now have the same number of steps in the K direction. And so we eliminate the bias for an, a shorter path to be an optimal path simply because it is shorter. So here are the alignment errors for the same 200 meter sections of the logs I showed earlier, but now on the KL coordinate system. And if we compare these to the IJ, the alignment errors on the IJ coordinate system, you can see that they are simply a rotated version of the alignment errors on the IJ. And we can zoom in to the area within the blue box to see the alignment errors in more detail. And so again, we can find the path that minimizes the sum of alignment errors, which here lies at about negative 40 lag. And so this tells us that the depths in log one are about 40 meters deeper than their corresponding depths in log two. And again, this optimal path gives us a sequence of corresponding depths that we can map back to, from time, back to depth to get our final correlation. And here I've shown just three such pairs of corresponding depths. <coughs>
So now that you have an idea of how to find a sequence of corresponding depths that optimally align to logs, what we're really interested in is how to simultaneously correlate many logs. So here again are the six locations of the wells I showed previously. And just for reference, the two logs that we've been working with came from the two wells circled in blue. Now, a common way to correlate many logs is to first perform pairwise correlations of logs one and two, then two and three, three and four, and so on, using the earlier correlations as constraints for later correlations. But the problem with this is that any errors that exist within the earlier correlations are propagated through to the later correlations. And so the final answer depends upon the order in which the logs were correlated. And for these six logs, there are actually 720 ways that we can order these logs. And so that essentially could give us 720 different answers. But what we want is one consistent correlation. So instead, we can perform pairwise correlations between all possible log pairs and then maintain consistency among these correlations. And for our six velocity logs, there are 15 possible pairs which denoted by the line segments here. And this gives us 15 pairwise correlations over which to maintain consistency. To explain what I mean by maintain consistency, let's look at the three logs circled in blue. So here are the velocity logs for those three wells again. So now if we perform pairwise correlation between logs one and two, we may find that a depth Z1 in log one corresponds to a depth Z2 in log two. And similarly, when we correlate logs two and three, we may find that Z2 also corresponds to depth Z3 in log three. So when we correlate logs one and three, we expect that Z3 and Z1 correspond. But this doesn't always happen in automatic methods. And the use of dynamic warping to correlate these three logs is similar to what Dave showed earlier. And so we could use a similar method here, but we would have to apply constraints, as he mentioned. And so this path that I've drawn here between the three corresponding depths can become essentially one constraint. But if we have four or five or six wells, then there are actually 342 ways that I can draw this path among the corresponding depths. And this gives us 342 constraints per corresponding depth, per sequence of corresponding depths. So if we have 1,000 corresponding depths, this gives us 342,000 constraints. And these constraints go into the alignment error calculation, as Dave mentioned. And so the alignment error array um, increases in size with the number of well logs. And so dynamic warping becomes just too costly for correlating wells. So instead, we must use a different method to maintain consistency among the pairwise correlations. To explain this, I'll look back at logs one and two. So if we perform pairwise correlation, as I described earlier, we may find that Z1 and Z2 correspond. Now, to align these two depths, we could shift Z1 up by some amount S1 and Z2 down by some amount S2. And essentially, we get the equations here where we can refer to the depths after aligning as relative geologic time. And because we use dynamic warping in order to find an optimal alignment of the logs, we can say that the relative geologic time should be equal, and therefore these equations are equal. Now, by rearranging this equation to get the unknown shifts on the left and the known depths on the right, we get an equation such as this. But this is just one equation for one pair of corresponding depths in one log pair. We actually have equation 
like this for every pair of corresponding depths in every log pair. And typically, the number of equations is much greater than the number of unknown shifts. And for our six logs, we have 170,000 equations and 70,000 unknown shifts. So this overdetermined system of linear equations leads us to a least squares problem, which we can solve to find shifts that optimally align all well logs simultaneously. So here again are the six velocity logs. Now if we use our method to first find sequences of corresponding depths through pairwise correlation and use these corresponding depths in a least squares problem to solve for shifts that um, ultimately align the logs, we can again produce an image such as this where any, relative, any constant relative geologic time gives us a set of six corresponding depths. And I'll just flip back and forth between um, the images so that you can see how things are aligning. And if we zoom in to the area within the black rectangle, we can see what's happening on a finer level. And so here you can see that we are aligning relatively thin, consistent velocity layers. And I'd also like to take a moment to remind you that we've done no pre-processing to these logs. And so large measurement errors still exist, and I've just pointed out two here. And you can see that these measurement errors do not have um, a negative effect on the overall alignment of the logs. And this is because we chose to use the L1 quarter norm rather than the L2 norm. So our simultaneous correlation method um, can be used for any number of logs and any type of logs. To demonstrate this, I'll show you another example from Teapot Dome with 13 porosity logs. Now for these 13 logs, we now have 78 possible pairs. And if we were to use dynamic warping to correlate these logs, it would require over 5 billion constraints per corresponding depth. But instead, we use our method, again, to find the corresponding depth pairs and then use the least squares method to find shifts that align these logs. To summarize, I'd like to point out key differences between existing methods and our method. So our method is comprised of two main parts. First, we perform pairwise correlations between all possible pairs of logs in order to find sequences of corresponding depths. And in the alignment error calculation, we choose to use a norm other than the L2 norm, specifically a norm less than one, in order to reduce the effect of large measurement errors on our data. We also use a rotated coordinate system to eliminate um, any need for manual interpretation. We, once we have these sequences of corresponding depths, we can then use a least square, we can then solve a least squares problem in order to find shifts that ultimately align all logs. And once we align these logs, we now can find set of corresponding depths for every constant relative geologic time in this image, which we can use to map from time to depth to get our final correlation. Thank you.